welcome to Acorn to Oak with Penny Quail Pierce and co-host Matthew Donaghy. Within each acorn, there is the DNA that strives to be a mighty oak tree. All it needs to reach its potential for greatness is to be activated. You are the acorn. On this show, we will share with you the tools and guidance you need to grow into the person you are meant to be. And now your host, Penny Quail Pierce and co-host Matthew Donaghy. Hi, uh, good afternoon, good evening, it's Penny and hopefully Matthew will be joining us uh, promptly. Uh, again, a couple of um, technical problems, but I'm sure it all gets sorted out really quickly. So this evening we wanted to talk uh, and discuss um, basically quite an emotive subject uh, around anxiety and depression. Is it nature or nurture? And, you know, it's really quite interesting people's take on this. And we've had quite a, a little bit of interest in the show um, coming up to it um, and people telling us that, their thoughts uh, around this. And it's, um, you know, it, it really is quite interesting. And every um, psychologist uh, will probably have a different opinion. But what you know, um, many studies suggest is that the neurotransmitter dopamine um, may play a, a, a role in the risk of depression. And it's actually coming up with your own personal thoughts or definition of what depression is. You know, what, what are the signs and symptoms of depression? Um, and I would say to you that, you know, with uh, the clientele that I work with, it's when people are coming in and they, they feel that they are either, you know, they're numbing out or they're using uh, maybe alcohol or recreational drugs or cigarettes or overeating or, you know, uh, gym addictions, going to the gym too often. Uh, because they just don't feel like they're connecting with life. And, you know, the depression then may or may not go down the route of going to a general practitioner and maybe getting some um, uh, drugs to help them with their feelings of not feeling connected uh not connect feeling connected to themselves not feeling connected to others maybe having you know um just not feeling like they can cope with everyday life um and then as the depression worsens maybe go, getting down to the stage where Physically, they feel tired all the time. They don't feel motivated. They may well feel that, um, you know, life is crushing, crushing them. And they may well feel that, you know, they don't have the energy maybe to get up off the couch or to uh, go to school or to go to work or all of these types of things. You know, and there's a, a huge variations of signs and symptoms of depression. Anxiety is slightly easier to um, look at the definition because anxiety is when you're in hurry, worry, when everything is, you know, will set you off in not necessarily into a full blown panic, panic, put my teeth back in, panic attack. But we'll basically, you know, you have anticipatory worry, maybe. So, you know, you, I know that my own grandmother would uh, have gastrointestinal um, symptoms whenever she was needing to go out, uh, especially if she was supporting her husband at a work function. So she would find that incredibly debilitating. And in fact, actually got to the stage where she didn't volunteer to go to any of her husband's work functions and stuff like that. So she would find 
um, being out in social situations quite difficult or where she felt that she needed to perform. So that is a form of anxiety. And then, of course, the anxiety may go from that to, again, being not, you know, housebound and not feeling that you can go to the local shop because of the anxiety of getting there or what people will ask you and all sorts of different things going on uh, in your mind in your conscious mind that will keep you stuck into a pattern of anxiety and you know anxiety can be incredibly debilitating and you know i have seen uh, many clients coming uh, to see me in practice for you know um, panic attacks and all sorts of different things which i have helped them unpick but you know, it's also looking, as I was saying, at the nature and nurture. You know, sometimes uh, when we grow up in families and someone has been suffering, maybe a parent or a grandparent has been suffering from anxiety and depression, we can learn quite early what those signs and symptoms are. And if it's in the family, then it becomes slightly more acceptable for us to do that behavior as a child. And I was talking with someone last week and they were just basically saying that she was concerned because um, her husband had bought her daughter uh, a worry monster or worry, uh, a, a thing that she could actually use to um, help her with worry. And she was actually saying, you know, actually, she she felt or she she discussed uh, the thing that maybe this would actually worsen the fact that her daughter was getting some attention from the fact that she was constantly holding this thing and using it for anxiety. And it's really quite interesting. I mean, the, the, you know, obviously this is just one case and, you know, and it, it, it can be that we learn, uh, you know, that actually if we are, we, we do show signs of anxiety and we become known for signs of anxiety, that it is a way of us getting uh, positive strokes. In other words, it's acceptable and it's just how that person does a thing. And so when we were actually discussing doing the program, you know, the nature nurture has it come down through our family line? Is it somebody who has had uh, depression? Is it because of, you know, and I was uh, in the write up, I was talking about the research that uh, was done in Russia uh, with 177 male adolescents uh, and, you know, looking at depression rates uh, and the rise of depression rates. And is it because, you know, their their parent or rearing included physical violence or punishment, hostility, lack of respect for the child's point of view, um, unjustified criticism in front of others, and you know some of some of that research uh, was absolutely fascinating and looking at the boys. Uh, you know, especially with rejected, rejecting their mothers and a specific form of dopamine um, uh, was found in their blood uh, and which leads obviously to major depression and suicidal tendencies. And what I found astonishing when I was doing a little bit of research just to get some of those numbers was that, you know, by uh, 2020, anxiety and depression are projected to be the second leading cause of disability worldwide. And when you look at that type of prediction, especially in research, you, you tend to take it slightly more seriously than having a chat or a cuppa with the, your neighbour and discussing uh, anxiety and depression. And you, you look at it and just go, well, that is astonishing. And, you know, we should be, 
as a global family and the family of humanity be helping turn this around. Um, you know, anxiety and depression uh, are are something that is rife and epidemic at, at epidemic levels in society right here, right now. And you just look at it and go, we we have to find a better way of helping the people who suffer from anxiety and depression. And, you know, I go back to Acorn to Oak's um, core methodology and I just look at it and go, you know, here, here are the, you know, the three levels of consciousness. The first level of consciousness being our conscious minds, which is just 10 percent of our mind's capacity. But in that 10 percent, we run our daily lives. It's the, the story factory that we have in our minds. It's the, you know, it's how we do uh, life. It's fight or flight. So, you know, if we have um, fight or flight, um, which is on hyper alert, which doesn't help with the anxiety state. In fact, you know, one of the reasons that um, we as uh, as human beings had fight or flight was to make sure that we would survive uh, our um, ancestral history of being, you know, cavemen. And if a saber toothed tiger came along, you know, we wanted to be able to dump our adrenaline and dump dopamine into our bloodstream so that we could run really fast to get out of the way of this saber-toothed tiger. However, you don't meet saber-toothed tigers walking down, you know, Park Lane in London. Well, you hope not anyway. <laughs> it's like, okay, fair enough. So that time of, of being has gone, but we still have the fight or flight response and therefore if unfortunately with some of the ways that our society are is today with some of the things that we eat and some of the things that we drink and some of the chemicals that we ingest uh, we're looking at you know obviously it's a case of fight or flight is actually beginning to be um, uh, set off by outside things, and this is the you know, the environmental uh, factor in in some of this anxiety or gross anxiety. And you know the way that we have um, evolved as human beings is in the West now, and also in the East. Don't get me wrong; I'm not letting the East off either. In on, on Earth, we are in so much competition with each other, and that leads to huge amounts of anxiety and depression. And when I look at you know the competition that we put our children under, you know even from the age, you know quite young age of you know three, four, five. Uh, where we're, you know, they're moving into schools. It's how people look, what they, how they're dressed. You know, the, the children pick up on this so quickly. You know, my luckily my son is two and a half. He hasn't quite gotten into that competition yet, um, and he's a very secure little boy. So when he goes to nursery, there isn't the competition. He goes to a forest school, so they're outside most of the time. Um, you know, at the moment he's a vegetarian, and we, you know, he wasn't vaccinated, so therefore he has a very very healthy immune system but you know again when we look at how much um, competition that we allow our children to buy into and how they look and how they don't look and what shoes they've got on their feet and you know what iPads they've got and all of this is not helping us to actually introduce quiet and peace 
And it is the quiet and the peace that allows children and adults, don't get me wrong, and adults, to actually live a life that is joyful and live a life that is happy. But if we keep on putting, um, you know, stress on each other and stress on our children as well as our adults and also, you know, the older people where it's still competition um, with each other to gain resources or gain attention or gain affection or um any of these things is just outrageous that we cannot be more compassionate and empathetic towards other people's needs. And, you know, most of the time when a client comes to see me, you know, they are amazed that, you know, if you come and see me for an appointment, it's a two hour appointment. And, you know, I'm also a homeopath, so I will go through the whole case before I even suggest what type of road or what avenue of treatment I would um, highly recommend to the person who's come to see me. So it's listening to those people, you know, when we actually look at it. And in, um, I know America is very, very different from the UK, but the UK, it, you know, we have the national health and we all go, uh, and our first point of contact is with a general practitioner. And that general practitioner, because it's the national health, you literally get 10 minutes to talk about what you need to talk about, unless you've uh, pre-thought it and asked for a double appointment. You, literally, the GP gets 10 minutes. One is putting him in, in a huge amount of stress to try and uh, help you and diagnose you and send you away with either a prescription or advice or whatever it is that you need. But it's not an awful long time to listen and give that individual a voice. And, you know, one of the things that leads to depression most is not being heard. So I'll see you after the break. Conscious connection to a more mindful world. Om Times Radio. IOM FM. Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Home Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. I'm Kathy Williams, host of Sexy Mom Abundant Life radio show on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific. On the show, we explore living abundantly in every area of your life. Ways to let go of limiting patterns and beliefs and to step into the flow of creativity and possibilities, knowing you are supported by the universe. We are talking about your life. Ever wonder, is this as good as it gets? No, it could be so much better. At Acorn to Oak, we know you are seeking more happiness, joy, unconditional love, financial freedom, passion, and purpose. Find your unique mojo and live an extraordinary life. Want to know more? Contact us at our website, acorntooak.org.uk. One in three adults has prediabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your football buddy, your football buddy, or you, your best man. 
your worst man. <gasps> you, your dog walker, your cat jogger. While one in three adults has prediabetes, with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. So we're back and just before the break, I was beginning to talk about, um, you know, again, you know, one of the things that can be incredibly helpful in anxiety and depression is allowing the person who has uh, that issue or problem in their lives a voice so they can voice where they're at. Um, what is actually happening for them, whether it is something that needs to be looked at from, um, you know, maybe none of us had the perfect parenting, none of us had the perfect upbringing. Is it something that has come up from there? Um, you know, was it a case of physical a punishment or hostility or a lack of respect for the child's point of view. Uh, maybe, as I was saying, unjustified criticism in front of others. It may have come in, you know, when people were having problems. I know in my own story, my own uh, past, you know, um, I couldn't read. I was, I was very profoundly dyslexic and still am, and but couldn't read until I was 13. So as you can imagine, I was was, you know, uh, especially at school, it was a, a difficult time because I would uh, be joshed and uh, completely disrespected by my my um, compatriots. Uh, so the other kids used to bully me uh, or try and bully me. Um, and, you know, the teachers were always, uh, you know, they were, they were trying to be helpful, but they would just say, you know, pay more attention you know I was in a mainstream school um, and you know there was no help or advice and I can remember you know at the age of about 14 basically saying you know yes you crack this you can read to a certain degree now um, but the only way uh, I, I'm going to be happy is to make sure I'm happy um, and realise, you know, quite young, you know, as a, uh, a teenager, that I was in charge of how people uh, reacted to me, and I was not going to be swayed by what they said. However, that takes uh, quite a lot of resolve. And not all uh, children uh, and youngsters in any way, uh, they are swayed by their peers uh, an awful lot. And unfortunately, um, you know, it's like in nature, you know, if, if the... If, if somebody, you know, if an animal was wounded, they're more likely to get attacked. If, uh, you know, if they're not a good runner, then they're going to be the ones who are caught by predators, etc., etc., etc. And unfortunately, humankind is no better than that. You know, if there's a problem uh, with with some, someone's perception or somebody's, you know, anxiety levels, you know, they will be joshed by other kids. They will be, you know, or, you know, again, if they're seen as grumpy or depressed, uh, you know, they won't get the the friends, they won't get the people who are there necessarily to help and support them. And, you know, children are actually quite uh, savage to other children in, in an awful lot of ways when things are seen as this is unnormal or it's not you know, not not seen as the general run of um, how sh people should be. 
and it's it's really quite sad and it's you know you need to uh grow in maturity before you realize that there there is as many different ways of doing things as there are people on the planet and what is normal you know that's one of my biggest things i think is who who decides what normal is because you know all we're doing is we're you know we're, we're taking where you know in a herd of animals we're just looking at where's where's the speed of, of the general herd and that's what we describe as being normal but there's people who are on maybe on the left side of it people who are on the right side of it people who are above it people who are below it you know it's it's as many different ways and it's about finding or encouraging people to find what their center is what their core is and yes we all worry to a certain degree we all have worries and things that you know can spark us off and make us go you know i wonder what if you know but it's again that's very much as i was beginning to say you know that's the 10 percent. that's the conscious mind the conscious mind is telling us you know i need to worry about this i need to worry about paying my mortgage i need to worry about uh you know how this looks for other people or what is going on here and it's actually looking at it and realizing that the conscious mind is there to help us to survive it's our daily living structure and in order for us to make sense of the world and um, to make sense of you know the five senses that are bringing in information you know smells tastes touches all those things and we're, we're bringing that into our minds to make sense of it and in order to make sense of it the rational mind actually looks at it and goes what what is this information and builds up stories around how to make sense of things so if somebody you know and i've 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 worked with many uh children on this where it's a case of when they go to school and they arrive and it's not a school that wears uniform they feel as soon as they walk into the school they're being judged on what they wear what uh, how they look and you know are they clean and tidy are they scruffy are they you know have they got you know depending on whether it's girls or boys you know the boys are not so worried about fashion but the girls are you know are they wearing, wearing something that's trendy and in sync with everybody else or are they hippie-ish or are they too preppy or are they and, and again take it you know the kids put people in different brackets so that they can put them into a box and they've made sense of it and in doing that you know if somebody bites their nails or they do this or they do that again they feel like they're being judged which then leads to more anxiety and eventually you know anxiety will go down the route as we suppress more and more it goes down to the to the root of depression when we're not feeling connected with our you know our, our family which is humanity and when we start feeling disconnected you know disconnected from ourselves disconnected from our family our global family and when then we feel like we can no longer um partake of the things that everybody else partakes of so it it's looking at it and just going whoa you know nature or nurture depression yes some of it is nature and some of it is nurture i would say maybe 50 50 uh, but we do need to look at how 
um, you know, we've been reared and how our parents have been reared and how their parents were reared. So, you know, whenever I'm talking about ancestral healing, I'm talking about moving things back seven generations to clear everything so that we can be more of um a blank page so we can actually start looking at making better and more informed decisions about how we want to be in our lives without taking on board some of the nature and the nurture and you know nature and nurture is a really important thing to have and it's just just looking at it and going, you know, when something comes in and we're ang anxious about something is actually looking at it and going, well, what's the truth around this? Why, why is anxiety here? Is it because I'm frightened about my survival? Is my survival under threat here? Or is it that I'm anxious that I will not be liked? or I don't feel worthy of the attention that I'm getting, or what is the story factory that's going on around the anxiety? And I remember one particular case um, that uh, came to me, um, quite a young lass in her uh, early 20s, and she came uh, to me because she was suffering from panic attacks. And the panic attacks, you know, she was trying to move her career on and she was uh, finding that she would have panic attacks before public speaking, which an awful lot of people do. You know, they start getting butterflies, etc., etc., etc. But hers was so extreme that she began, because it was the nature of the work that she was doing, she began taking um, uh, off-the-shelf medication called CALMS. I don't know if you have them in the United States, but they're a herbal thing that actually helps you to become less anxious. And it has a form of St. John's Wort in it. And she was taking more and more of those. And what was very interesting for me to hear was when she described it, what she described was she didn't just take them what she actually said was i gobbled them down and i went mm. and for me that was the center of the case because it's not a uh, expression that you hear very often when someone says i gobbled them down and as we moved through uh, a few weeks of treating her and we used breath work with this and various other bits and pieces, what we realised was that the panic was underneath the actual side, the actual crutch or, or the, you know, the centre of the case. The panic was just a film over absolute anger. And the, the anger, you know, one of the things that I say about depression is one of the biggest emotions in depression is suppressed anger. You know, because uh, the only way we can deal with it, because it's never been safe to feel the anger, is to suppress it to such a level that we numb out and we become totally and utterly divorced from our authentic self. And in pressing, pressing down that anger, as we began to work with it, she got in touch with more and more and more of the anger. And her story uh, became quite um, profound um, because what actually had happened was the anger and the depression, had, the etiology was because she had been abused as a child. And in dealing with, with those emotions and in dealing with that depression and uh, raising the vibration of that emotion up, she dealt with it all and actually has become a very successful public speaker and a very, very successful um, financial broker. And what happened was it all started off with this one, uh, you know, 
uh, thing that I, I, I panic a little bit when I'm public speaking. And what is amazing is helping people unravel that uh, knot of yarn, which so uh, hopefully Matty's here. Hey, good evening. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> that was obviously a journey and a half. <laughs> uh, it certainly was, yes. Uh, some learning in there. I'll reflect yeah. on that later. See what the <laughs> learning is. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't you just love it? <laughs> <laughs> Such is life. Anyway, we were we discussing um, anxiety and depression, nature and nurture. And yep. I was just talking about a case where we we started off with an etiology of panic attacks, um, usually brought on by the thought of public speaking. And yep. as we dealt with the with the anxiety and and the depression, we realised that underneath was anger. And right. as we dealt with the anger, we realised that we went back to the etiology of child abuse. And as we moved through the whole journey, uh, what happened was this particular client dealt with the anger through breathwork and dealt with... Um, some of the trauma in in fact actually um went to court and um uh basically confronted the person who had abused her and afterwards went through and became a very good public speaker and a, fanta a fantastic financial broker so it just it was just telling that story that of when we deal with anxiety or depression, uh, we can actually move through through to freedom. But, you know, some of the things I know you've missed an awful lot of it, uh, Matthew. <laughs> yeah, um, interesting how other than the court stuff, all of that resonated with me and parts of my story. Um, and I think it's a, a, a sort of like, it is a very, anxiety and depression is a, a very common thing these days. Um, and it, something I've experienced in, in, in my life. And um, I think one of, the, one of the worst bits is we, we don't talk about it enough and people aren't sort of, aware about it um, and when you're in that state or especially when I was dealing with my depression there were sort of days where you feel like you, you don't even want to get out of bed and you get anxious around sort of you're almost it's, it's almost like there's something bad about to happen all the time or that that's sort of how it feels so you actually the the worse it gets the more you sort of close in um, and you don't perhaps share with friends and family because the thought forms around that is I don't want to be a burden on anybody um, and so you put on a brave face and and just crack on and it's kind of some of the biggest smiles are hiding the biggest wounds um, mm. and yeah. I think yeah. for me that was one of the things that when I when I actually reached out um, and it was Penny I worked with and and got the help that I needed, it was such a a sigh of relief that I could actually be honest around my feelings and just owning that it makes such a difference. Um, I think people shy away from it because there's there's a sense of shame around. Oh, I can't tell anybody that I'm depressed because then they'll think. I've got a mental illness and and the whole word mental there, there, there's obviously a stigma around it um people don't want to 
sort of use that word and say, I've got a mental illness because people think they're crazy. Whereas actually it's just being emotionally imbalanced or that's what my experience was. Um, because my when when I was actually going through it, I thought that I was I was just sad and scared. Whereas actually, very much like Penny said, underneath that sad and scared was a whole ball of anger mainly directed at myself um that i hadn't even hadn't even clocked it didn't even mm. put the two and two together um and the more i worked on that the the clearer i became and was able to sort of work through some of the other emotions as well so we'll we'll pick this up continue. after the break we certainly will <laughs> <laughs> a conscious lifestyle for a mindful life. Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single OM Times endeavor. Host your show with OM Times Radio Network. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of OM Times Magazine's flagship radio show, What is Going OM? My passion is sifting through information, research, and innovations from new thought teachers, speakers, and researchers, pushing back the boundaries of what we know about life, energy, metaphysics, and the universe. I love shifting perceptions about who we are, why we're here, and how quickly impossible becomes normal when we open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. So if you're the kind of forward-thinking, eager investigator of what lies beyond the current reality that most perceive, why not make a date to come play with me in the field of possibilities at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday, and together we can discover what's really going on. We are talking about your life. Ever wonder, is this as good as it gets? No, it could be so much better. At Acorn to Oak, we know you are seeking more happiness, joy, unconditional love, financial freedom, passion, and purpose. Find your unique mojo and live an extraordinary life. Want to know more? Contact us at our website, acorntooak.org.uk. Long ago, you wouldn't think of galloping on a horse while doing calligraphy. And you wouldn't have attempted to ride your bike while typing a letter. Yet you think you can safely operate a multi-ton vehicle while texting? Behind the wheel is no place to multitask. If you want to BRB, drive now and text later. Lives depend on it. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. So hi, hi, we're back, and um, it, basically talking about anxiety, and depression, nature or nurture, and you know we've been talking a, a little a bit um, about how um, people can get caught into competition, which can lead to, uh, you know, definitely with children, um, looking at. Uh, how they're doing their lives, uh, is, are their lives on track, are they wearing the right kit, the right gear, do they look a certain way, um, have they got, you know, are they popular with the other kids, etc, uh, etc, et and how anxiety and depression can come in when they feel that they're not conforming to the normal. Mm -hmm. And I did say earlier on, Matthew, that what is normal, you know me, I can have a good rant now and again. <laughs> yeah, well, well, this is it. There, there, there is no normal. And uh, I think we sort of almost set the, by, 
set the bar really high and kids are expected to all be doing well we'll we'll have different skill sets we'll learn at different paces and i think kids can be sort of damaged quite badly when when we they're, they're told they're not good at something um because actually they could be very good at something they just need more practice um and so i think it make, makes a a huge difference when you have sort of positive affirmations as opposed to the negative ones um and when we're when we're told oh well these are the set grades or this is what you're expected to do in sport some people just naturally aren't sporty um but being told they're not good at something can automatically sort of set off a, an affirmation within yourself where you keep telling yourself oh well so and so told me this once uh, and i'm not good at that and yeah it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned sport because you know for me as as you're aware you know i'm profoundly dyslexic uh i couldn't read until i was 13 but the one thing i was good at was sport you know yep. stick a, a racket in my hand or a hockey stick in my hand or and i could i was outstripped most people and i was playing at county level uh for all of these things you know uh swimming i was uh brilliant at swimming and so it was the one thing that i could hold my head up around was i may not be educationally sound but the one thing I could do was if you put me on a field, I could run faster than most people. I could definitely dribble a ball faster than most people. I could play tennis. I could swim. So I was constantly up on the stage receiving a cup or whatever. So I think that's what gave me a, a healthy sense of self. But when it came to education, it took me a long, long time in my life to catch up with what I felt that I should be doing. I mean, as, as you know, that um, I, in the end, took two master's degrees. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology and I have a master's degree in nursing. And it's, you know, you look at that and just go, talk about overcompensate later on in life. Uh, but yes, and I, I can see that now, whereas at the time it was a case of I, I just needed to prove that I could educationally hold my head up. Yeah. Um, and I think that's I think, really interesting that you say that because my experience, I was exceptional at sport and it was the one thing that I, I just loved because I was good at. But I was told by one of my teachers when I was younger that sport doesn't sport sport. It's a hobby. It's not a career. So it's really interesting that I took that one comment on board and never thought I could succeed in sport because of it wasn't a career. Um, whereas Penny's more, if you tell Penny she can't do something, it's watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and that's that's always been, you know, thank thank heaven that has always been my attitude. Is uh, you know, I think very much when I made that decision that nobody was going to run or control my life. It very much became a mantra, and you know that came in about thirteen, fourteen when I finally cracked being able to read. And I had spent years, I would say seven years, in feeling insecure and feeling like I, were, I was never going to amount to anything. And I think once I actually cracked it, um, it was a case of nobody is ever going to do that to me again. And yeah, so yeah, I've always had that attitude of you know seize seize life by the by the feet and give it a damn good shake and see what falls out <laughs> be be very open to the opportunities 
and just go for it and have as much fun and be as happy as you possibly can. And I think having had that little bit of adversity at the beginning of my life helped me turn it around real quick. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, an awful lot of people will look at that and, you know, maybe the attention of being anxious or having a bit of a problem with um, different things is the payoff for not making that type of decision. But I think for me, it was just a case of, I was again, it's nature or nurture from, from, the, from the nurture point of view. I was uh, the youngest of four kids. And therefore, if you wanted positive attention, then you were a go-getter. And therefore, that's the decision I made was, uh, you know, not on, only am I going to be a go-getter, uh, but I'm going to outstrip most go-getters. <laughs> so, it, it is, it's really important just to look at your own definitions of what you think anxiety is. And what you think depression is. And how do they show up in your own life? Because, uh, as I was saying before Matthew got on the call, was very much a case of, again, going back to that 10% of your conscious mind. And our conscious mind thinks it's in control. But it's not. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not. And it's, um, I, was, I was just pausing a little bit there because I was getting a little bit of feedback from the radio. But it's really important to know that the conscious mind, it's part of the conscious mind's job is to make sense of what is happening in your daily life. And therefore, it makes up stories to try and make sense of what is going on. But then we get sucked into that story factory and it's actually not the truth. You know, it is what our mind is made up. And we can get off that loop or cycle by doing a really good pattern interrupt. And a pattern interrupt is making a new empowered decision. A NED, we call them for short. <laughs> yeah, we like a good NED. <laughs> oh dear. And it is also just having a great sense of humour about yourself. Because the trouble is, you know, unfortunately, kids and teenagers and young adults take themselves far, far too seriously. Yeah. And it's, you know, life is a game. Okay. And, you know, it's learning to play that game to suit yourself. Yeah. 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 So Matthew, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, and I, I think from from uh, obviously from personal experience <coughs> and, and dealing with with clients, it's sometimes the first step's the hardest. So just admitting it to yourself that you're not sort of feeling maybe as just as happy as you are, and obviously I'm sure Penny's covered it, but there's, there's lots of varying degrees of, of depression. Um, you could, for some people, it's it's more extreme than others, but it's it's about realizing that actually you're not feeling joyful 
all the time. Um, and sometimes it can take baby steps at first. Um, I was very fortunate along my journey to find Penny and Breath work. So it was very fast and very effective for me. Um, but it's, yeah, a lot of it, it's amazing how many people out there um, feel the same way. Um, we've said it on previous shows, like nobody's had the perfect life. And some people may have um, gains in certain areas, but in in other areas they're they're not so good um so for me the the physical side was was great but the mental experience w was not so great and it was through myself telling myself stories around things which f almost fueled the depression so mm, yeah. um i love the quote um worrying is like praying for what you don't want because when I look back and think about how how much of the time I was disconnected and I was worrying and this worrying about things that a meant nothing um, and you'd almost make up situations as I said earlier like you tell yourself that you can't be honest with your friends and family because you'll be a burden on them. I know, I mean, it's it, ridiculous, isn't it? It is. It is. When you think about it, it is absolutely ridiculous. It's like these are the we turn away from the people that care about us the most. And for me, I very much wore a mask. It was I wasn't showing my true self to my friends. I would just put on an act the whole time. And actually, we we've got a real the first step can be realizing you, you don't have to do that. Um, yeah, the tears of a clown. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the show tonight and we will see you next week. Love it. Take care, Take care. everybody.